little bit of lag last time, um, which means that it is still December 28th, 2009. It is Day 9 Daily, number 32, again, for the third time. Third time around. Third time around. Pfft, who cares? Um, so, oh yeah, I said December 28th. Dude, I'm autistic. It is December 8th. <laughs> December 8th, 2009. I didn't just suddenly fast forward past Christmas. Yeah, that kind of happens to cause some lag whenever there's... um. Whenever there's, you know, time travel. But let me go ahead and try to do this. Again, unfortunately for any of you watching on On Demand, I had to cut off the first portion. Um, I'm going to try to jump right back in where I was at before. So um, let's just transition right back to the main screen. Um, I always hate when these things end up being split into multiple parts because I like having the viewer experience be nice, easy, fabrizi. But um, alas, something seems to be going really, really wrong. So hopefully I'll figure that out at some point. Um, you know, I think it's because I'm getting emails and those are popping up and screwing everything up all to hell. But basically, the big thing I want to emphasize in this early game opening is that if you do a gas deal exactly the way Stork has, first of all, take some gas from him just to really bring the noise a little bit. Um, but second of all, make sure you have a good follow-through plan with the gas deal. Make sure that you're not just stealing out of impulse, um, because you can. You don't want to be doing anything like that. Um... Because if you do... Hold on a minute. Okay, I... I just want to make sure everyone caught this, because I didn't actually see this the first time around. There's Waldo, there he is! I found you, Waldo, you can't, you can't hide from me. It's Waldo, there he is, right there. Can't even hide from me in South Korea. Got him right there. The flam! So yeah, we went ahead and did a little Waldo spotting. Yeah, steal is gas, always a good thing to do. Notice how Flash is not overreacting. Notice how he isn't bringing all his SCVs off to kill it. Um, and that's a thing a lot of, a lot, a lot, a lot of Terran players do. They just see the gas get stolen and go, Oh, pfft, well, I want to build it at the exact same time every game, so I guess I'm going to take five SCVs off minerals to kill it. Which, of course, costs you way more than the hundred that the Protoss invested in the Assimilator. So very, very clearly not something you want to be doing. Now watch the way that Flash responds to this. I think this is one of the best responses to having your gas stolen. Because your gas is stolen, you immediately know that the gateway almost certainly is delayed. And if the gateway did come out on time, then definitely the cybernetics core is going to be delayed. So we know that we're not going to encounter Dragoons super, super early. Consequently, it's okay to get that delayed gas, because we can stay alive with just a bunker. Um, if there is any sort of zealot attack that's going to come out, it is, again, going to be delayed. Spending 100 um, minerals that early as Protoss on the assimilator really will screw you up quite a bit. Um, but again, Flash, or excuse me, Stork, Protoss, um, I'm just going to put a box around and be like, this guy, because that's hard to, <laughs> that's hard to mess up. Yeah, this guy, Friendly Neighborhood Orange, a.k.a. Storkaroo, um, he has definitely an excellent follow-through. He, he's doing the gas steal, and he's going to respond by playing normally. He's not going to respond by doing anything weird like rushing for Dark Templar, expanding a million, bazillion, trillion times. I'm just going to go straight for the Dragoon, get the, the range upgrade early on. Oh, excuse me, a little bit of that um, full throttle energy drink is coming back up. Or, excuse me, Rockstar. Oh, man, it's great. I, I love this placement. This is excellent placement. Um, really, what we want to do in this matchup... Um, I'm actually going to spend a little bit of time talking about this. Against a Zerg player, we'd want the bunker right back here. Or maybe even up here, touching the top of this command center. That way, um, it's much harder to surround this bunker with Zerglings. And we can repair it from a pretty wide... Um, side range. But here, we pretty much don't want stuff advancing forward. We want this to be really what the Dragoons have to deal with. We don't want to let the Dragoons be able to attack the command center or anything like that. Um, also, we want to create a fairly small gap here, so that way, if anything tries to run by, we can cut it off early on. Look at how beautiful of a response this is by Flash. Incredible, incredible job. Everything is normal as can be by Stork. Incredibly, incredibly normal. You know, in a sense, I would almost say that Flash is a little bit ahead at this point because of, oh man, yeah, oh look at him, he is, his mouth is imploding. He must have like a gobstopper in there. 
But um, as you know, he does in fact not have a gobstopper. He's just been working a, out a lot, um, as is indicated by the large array of homoerotic pictures on on the TeamLiquid.net thread uh, regarding it. So I'm I'm happy for him though. It is it is a good thing to work out. That's definitely something I need to start doing because I stood up a few days ago and I felt my thighs touch and I was like, ooh, time to get back to the gym. Whoopsie daisies. So um, it does appear yes, it does appear that we're on the old Heartbreak Ridge on this map. So the one move with the um, the uh, Goliath through the middle is actually at another spoke. I'll, I'll I'll mention that when I see it, where where I accidentally fabricated a memory out of thin air. Um, but if anything, I would say that Flash is probably a little bit ahead given this build because Stork is doing everything normally. But this expansion from Flash, I mean, if we pretend that the gas deal didn't even exist for Terran, Terran could have done this build the exact same way with the exact same timings. Um, but I think the one thing, the one advantage that we're seeing Stork exploit right now is the fact that these factories are going to be delayed no matter what. Therefore, the tank is going to be a little bit late. Therefore, any vulture harass that happens or any push that happens is going to happen a little bit late, which is why it tries to squeak out that extra expansion down here. And again, note that these are rubble paths. This map apparently has not been introduced yet. I know I've seen this map in play, so it may have been from the Pro League, but I'll, I'll, I'll double-check myself. A good job by, by Stork trying to push in here, just get a little bit of extra damage. And see, this is exactly what you want to do. That's actually a, a reasonable amount of money that Stork's able to pull off from Flash just by repairing that so often. And this is one thing I love, is Flash's turret placement is, is superb, or stupendous, to use a word I haven't used in many years absolutely stupendous placement and again nothing but ultra ultra normalness there hopefully we'll get a look at um the turret placement by flash here in just a little bit okay so here's one scroll down there's another and i'll actually bring up the map so basically there's one right here there's one right here and there's another one right there um with these tanks here at the front so generally when you're Terran, you build turrets in this ring like fashion so that way it prevents observers from getting in, namely to your factories, and you can deal with drops nicely. You have this whole rim covered from drops. But imagine now if we have this line here. Um, Flash is almost certainly comfortable enough dealing with drops just by you know having these turrets keep the, keep the reaver back, and then Flash can use his tanks to kill it off. Um, but when we have these three turrets like this... It means it's the minimum amount of money required to hide all the factories that end up being built right here. We actually saw Flash have very similar turret placement in, um, in Flash's game against Best on Fighting Spirit. And that is something I absolutely love, because this will screw quite a bit of Protoss players up, just having that sort of incredible placement, because the Protoss really can't get in here with observers. And if you plan to build your factories tight to that left wall, it's really hard to know if there's some sort of timing push coming up, which is actually exactly what we see happen in this game. So we have the two factories out, and I really want to highlight when that observatory comes out from Stork. Notice the fact that Stork built his second command center before he got a robotics facility. Um, I'm almost certain that's, that is the case. I just want to double check that real fast just to make sure I wasn't overlooking something while I was doing all my excessive talking. It didn't feel like it. And there is the expansion. And yep, 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 yep. Sorry, I was just looking at the mini-map that whole time. That's what all that was. Um, but yeah, let's go ahead and cut right back to where we were before. Four. Sorry for the little scroller room. Yeah, so, see, look, these are very hidden factories. Notice how these are hugging the wall tightly. They're not built here flush with this factory. They're built all the way here. Uh, and, 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 you know, doubly, moreover, we can build extra factories here. Um, we can tuck them away very, very nicely there. We have a factory here for a spotter. We have the engineering bay there for a spotter. Just outstanding. Stupendous play by Friendly Neighborhood Store. So here comes a mid-game timing push. This is one of my favorite things absolutely ever to do with Terran, is this exact push when you, have, when you get four factories like this. And it's really, um, it's kind of an awkward time for the Protoss to deal with, because let us, let us suppose for a moment right now that Stork didn't get this expansion, and, the, and hence the Observer out so late. If Stork did that, he wouldn't be able to have seen this thing coming. 
But even so, even though Stork um, is in this situation where he has a pretty good economy, this is still going to be really rough for him. So in a sense, if, like, let me rephrase that. This build that Stork is doing, there is no way that Stork could have known this two-factor, or excuse me, this four-factory push was coming right now. In the case that Stork does a more normal build, that normal build is still going to have a lot of problems seeing that this four-factory push is coming, which is why I like it so, so, so much. Now, this, in my opinion, yes, yeah, see, here's some of the center movement. Um, this is, I really, really like this by Stork. A lot of players are going to push up like this, but Stork worked his way up and across like this, so that way he can have this narrow choke aid him when he pushes from here to there. Excellent, excellent use of this path right here. It's very thin, so you're not going to see it when you're doing big late game pushes. You don't want these big fat lanes to do it, but that little skinny lane right there is excellent for this sort of push. And I apparently have said Stork instead of Flash like eight times in a row. Hope everyone knows, because that's the way it's going to be. Um, I'm just absolutely horrific at naming these things. There's a lot of, there's, there's great stuff going on inside my head, but a lot of times it just comes out the wrong way. So hopefully, hopefully I'm still being clear. Hopefully you're just laughing at me and going, ha ha ha, Dave's an absent-minded retard. But you're still getting the good underlying understanding going on there. Look at this push Flash is doing right here. Incredible, incredible push by Flash. Absolutely amazing. Notice how he's taking advantage of that thin little crevasse that he's able to go across right there. So this is clearly a tough situation for Stork to be in. In this situation, um, this is an issue of scouting. Right now, when we have tanks set up right here, this is something that Stork um, would have trouble dealing with. If Flash established a position here, and then just sent a tank with two vultures here to break down this doorway, he could have continued to flood up here and then done a slower push here, but it would have been a secured um, piece of ground, effectively killing this expansion. And that really shows you the importance of scouting that sort of that sort of um, that sort of location. Notice though that we still haven't seen either player scout this top position. Really, I think that it would have benefited Flash quite a bit to have done that. But what's interesting is that Flash has full 100% confidence in this push. Because with this push right here, Flash is saying, I don't care if you've taken this third. This is designed to just kill you straight up. You know, to a certain extent, I bet Flash assumed that Stork did have a third. But um, Flash assumed the wrong expansion. So here's an incredibly, incredibly good job. We're going to rewatch this attack in just a little bit. Um, but very, very good job by Stork surrounding these things, picking off these tanks, and getting in a really, really good position. Notice how it's predominantly Dragoons. That is exactly the way you want to be holding off these sorts of early pushes. Almost nothing but Dragoons. Whoops, that mine did a lot of damage right there, but... You want to use pretty much all Dragoons to hold off these early pushes. So let's actually go through that just one more time. So we have some more Dragoons by Stork correctly. Okay, now watch the minimap right here. Watch these two yellow dots and versus these three orange dots. These orange dots are just getting a few shots off on that. We see a little bit of movement there. And see, here's another little dot coming by. Oh, God. Well, um, I assure you it actually ended up getting killed off. Very good technique to do these sorts of little in-between things. And look, this rally point here is going to be a pain to deal with. See, there's more stuff going on right there. One vulture down, this vulture's in the, in the red. That's actually really helping Stork having those guys there. Because again, I'm saying that you want a lot of early Dragoons, and let's actually take a moment to think about that. If we're going just early Dragoons, he's not going to have that many tanks, so we can get a pretty good arc, so our Dragoons aren't going to be taking maximum damage. We also can kill off the Mines and the Vultures pretty easily. But most importantly, whenever you do an early push as Terran, you get some key number of tanks, like 8, and then all your factories only produce Vultures. That's it. You don't do 2 tanks and 2 Vultures. You do nothing but Vultures, because that's really what's going to give you the momentum of the attack to push forward. So if you have only Vultures, you're going to be rallying these straight to the push. 
And the dragoons, as we see here on the mini-map, those dragoons are going to allow you to pick those things off much, much more easily than any number of zealots would be able to. So um, if you're worried about this sort of push, it is also okay, actually, I would say it's strongly recommended to get a shuttle with four zealots into it, because obviously these tanks need to stay very, very tightly packed together. But look at this spread by Stork. Could be a little bit better, could have maybe drag a few guys this way. But overall, very strong spread. Now watch how he's going to run just a handful of Dragoons forward. Okay, so these guys are obviously coming in from behind. That's excellent. But he's going to be running these Dragoons forward right here to pick these tanks off, right? And then these guys are backing up a little bit to take care of these Vultures. And this is exactly why you pretty much go just Dragoon. The Zealots really are not going to be able to do much of anything until they have speed or unless they're in a shuttle. But watch how calmly Stork deals with this right now. A lot of players are going to just attack move. Just like, go, 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 I need to kill it, I need to kill it. But now Stork is calmly just regrouping. Really intense situation to be in. Any plan he had with this Stargate has to be put on hold. Stork's going to be ultra, ultra, ultra patient. And Flash is going to continue to push normally. See, look, see how we saw four vultures just pop up there? It's because all these factories are making vultures. And those two vultures I don't think would have made the biggest difference. Um, I'm not so sure how I feel about this. Um, for any Terran player thinking about this, you move in, uh, small vulture numbers demolish small dragoon numbers. So, especially in these quantities. Um, I, I, I'm a little uncomfortable doing this because this push is just so weak right now. Because watch what Stork does. He holds back just a little bit, and then he's going to end up pushing out pretty, pretty, pretty soon here. Carefully sweeping around the top, not getting over eager, very calmly controlling his units, keeping them back. And this is one thing I, I try to emphasize a lot. Anytime you're doing pushing action, you should not think of it as the push to win. You should think of it as the push to get you an advantage. The most reasonable way to steal an advantage is to just take another expansion. Um, alternatively, you can do something like throw down another factory, or throw down another armory, or something like that. Um, all sorts of good things to think about that aren't just win-oriented. Because um, a lot of people tend to, they'll play like 10 games, maybe at C-, minus C level, and they'll just win with this 4 factory push. But then when they try it against better players, um, the 4 factory push doesn't end up winning. And, and such a Terran player ends up being a little bit confused and is like, oh, well, you know, what do I do now? So what's very important is you want to make an outrageous number of mines here. I mean, really, there's nothing wrong with having insane amounts of mines. Killing things off like that's fine, because you obviously don't want the mines to backfire, but really continuing to plant thick, dense fields of mines can only help you, and it's actually pretty key to dealing with these pushes. See, look at this. Hitting here from the side and hitting from the top. Nice, good arc spread. And look how long Stork also waited to move out with these Dragoons. Moving Dragoons forward to take the mine shots, and Stork manages to finally kill this thing off. But it doesn't mean that Flash somehow has lost the game. He has gotten the advantage of getting this command center done, right? So we have three bases versus three bases. The Protoss player is almost certainly going to be able to take a fourth base all of a sudden now. But um, overall, pretty, pretty close still. Maybe I would put Stork at a slight, slight advantage, but Flash definitely set himself up in a pretty position. Yeah, see, look at that. We just saw an armory up here off the map and this expansion coming down. That push was a setup for late game. It was an assist for any of you who are interested in basketball or volleyball. Now here we see carriers coming out. I'm going to explain exactly why carriers is a beautiful choice going on here. If you do a big push as Terran early on like this and it dies, it doesn't work, exactly what happened right here, how are you going to respond? Well, especially if you expanded the way that um, Flash did expand, um, you're going to be playing defensively. You're going to need to keep all your tanks back. You might focus on occasionally, not all the time, but occasionally adding an extra machine shop to get extra tanks because you just need the tanks so bad you're going to be mining up, you're going to be focusing on those upgrades. Now, if your opponent goes for Arbiters, this is something you account for in this situation. You think, well, I need to play defensive anyways, so playing defensively to account for Arbiters will also be a good thing to go for. 
So in a sense, um, Arbiters will not um, exploit the fact that Terran opened in this fashion. Um, however, if you start going Carriers, now this Terran player who is focusing so much on defense, we know that the Terran player isn't going to be attacking us right now, we know that we have this big time to allow us to get Carriers. In this time, Terran player is trying to establish himself, and then he sees Carriers and he goes, well, well I can't push now, um, I need to suddenly get a whole bunch of Goliaths. So he needs to get a whole bunch of Goliaths. So now all of a sudden the push is delayed even more. And then when this push finally comes out, um, it's too late. Because the, you know, the Protoss player has gotten the opportunity to expand so much. The Protoss player has all these carriers and ground units. In essence, to sum it up really succinctly, the fact that this push failed and that Terran needs to play defensively now makes carriers an excellent choice because it will continue to delay the Terran's push. Now, immediately some of you might say, well, how is this different from Carrier rushing to Terran who's powering early on? So let's say the Terran player um, is, is Flash, and Flash is doing his usual style where he gets all the armories and the factories early. In that case, um, if, you carrier, if, if you go for Carriers, you're still not going to have that many units, and when Terran comes out, he has this huge timing push. It's an incredibly strong timing push that was um, specifically designed. If you're going all ground units, timing push is going to walk over that. If Protoss committed to you know carriers and air units earlier, um, Terran can scan and see that and make the appropriate amount of Goliath and still crush you. So in essence, what you need is this huge fat timing window where you have three bases as Protoss and you can get carriers really, really comfortably before the next push. Or in other words, to delay the next push exactly what's happening here. Um, really, really cool to see that happen. So I'm going to re-emphasize this um, several times throughout this game. The fact that Flash's push is getting delayed more and more and more and more. And again, this, this is working because Protoss has three bases established. He's not trying to go two base carrier against a powering um, Terran. A stork instead is going three base carrier now and has a ton of money to expand. And look at this. Expanding to the top left corner. Beautiful choice. This is how Pusan um, was the first player I saw really, really put the hurt on on this map. Like, seriously, brilliant play by Pusan. Aggressively taking these corner expansions. I was very impressed, you know, before he got eliminated from the Star League. Um, with that hilarious game against Jadong. Oh man, go watch that. That was full of lulls. But yeah, so we have all these carriers going down. So you see that scan? So let's let's take a look at this. Terran's starting to push forward. See, he's securing this spoke because this expansion's now defended. And this was pretty much well defended as well. So, he, so uh, we're going to see a scan in just a second. Maybe I didn't go quite by it. Come on. Well, I heard a scan. <laughs> but I mean... Alright, so we have... I'm listening for it. I don't know if you guys can hear that as well as I can on my end, but basically, so this is the very typical play for Terran at this point, right? We're going to just sit back with our tanks, those tanks will keep us alive, and we're going to harass with vultures. But unfortunately, there's pretty much no place to harass. This is really the only one, but Stork's doing excellent true movement around here. So now we have the, the carriers coming out. Normally, Protosses are going to Stargate Carrier. Here is four Stargate Carrier, because there's a seriously giganto timing window that Friendly Neighborhood Stork can uh, take advantage of. So what we're going to see from the Terran player is um, this incredible amount of Goliath start pumping out right now. So these guys can't do any pushing action right now because... Um, excuse me, because that push died earlier. Let me actually reemphasize that a little bit better. Normally, if you're Terran and you scan, you see your opponent going for carriers, you think, oh, all right, I'm just going to go kill him, and then you go over and you kill him. But if early on you try to do a really big push and it died, you suddenly do not quite have enough units to just go kill him, right? Um, you did that push, so now you can get that expansion and those upgrades earlier. So you can't kill him now, you can kill him later. That's the whole goal of doing that sort of early push. And, or, um, and now the big problem for Flash is that he needs to have been in a situation where he can attack now, as opposed to having a really strong attack later. So this is the part where Stork was, or, um, Flash is probably just like, Ugh, like how long has this been around? And then when you scan it and you note that it's half mine, that's when you feel icky. So see, look at, look at Stork taking advantage of this big circular dynamic. There's absolutely nothing that Flash can do to push forward along either lane because there's Dragoons here just making sure things stay back. So, 
this is kind of similar. Yeah, see, here's the Goliaths, right? These Goliaths need to come out to deal with the carriers, because you need a critical mass of Goliaths before you can actually do enough damage um, to carriers. So right now, this push is getting super delayed by Flash. Normally, Flash would be moving forward with tanks and vultures, um... In not that long a time. See, there's the other scan, so he's, he's you know, double-checking for when those carriers are coming out. So a lot of times, Terran would be would have been getting ready to do some sort of push right now. Would have been prepared to, you know, exploit the fact that, you know, now he knows that his Protoss opponent is here. Uh, I do want to talk about the screen a little bit. Um, but yeah, so Terran can't really do anything right now because he just needs those Goliaths before he's confident enough to push. Look at this placement of these mines. This is actually um, a mine placement everyone should be very, very comfortable with. And if you're not, just practice it a little bit. It's really nice to know. This is the place where you're tempted with Dragoons to shoot this, but when the Dragoon is just in range to shoot this mine, the tank is just in range to shoot the Dragoon. Obviously, let, let's pretend for a minute that these mines are not here, and it's just this mine. Clearly, no Protoss is going to go for that. If the mines are out here then Protoss will clearly just kill it. But it's when it's right here that Protoss goes, I think I can get this, and you just get one extra shot off with the tanks. All those are little sorts of things that um, can, can only help. Um, and of course, that's a little bit more useful when you're actually pushing the Protoss, and he's trying to clear out the mines from your push so he can run in with Zealots. And he'll move forward with all his Dragoons to start clearing the mines out, and immediately the Dragoons will take some heavy damage, which is exactly, exactly what you want. So right now, Flash is trying to flood with tons of factories because he knows that his timing window is getting increasingly small. He needed to wait just a little bit longer to get extra Goliaths, so that way um, he would have enough to deal with the carriers. But he can't wait too long to get too many Goliaths because eventually the carrier and the ground army size will get so big. So here's the movement right here that I confused with this spoke right here. Flash is very, very good about moving into the center. And I haven't seen that, uh, I haven't seen a lot of Terran players do that, and I incorrectly assumed that it was because of that new spoke, and apparently I was just completely mistaken on that. But look at this movement, see? He's, he's curling into this center region, and even though it kind of makes a nice snaky um, shape to his units, it, it, it prevents this counterattack, or at least makes Protoss hesitate with these counterattacks. So here's a gross situation to be in. You know, if you're Terran, where do you push? We obviously are concerned about pushing here, because we have carriers that can cut us off right here, and there's a counterattack here, or we can, you know, um, or, and basically, if we do end up attacking this, this expansion and this expansion and this top one are home free. Protoss can expand as much as he wants up there. So Protoss looks, or excuse me, Terran looks like he's going for this killing blow, just trying to eliminate as much of the uh, Protoss' main as possible. This is very smart by Stork. He's exploiting how spread out around the map he is, and the fact that he has a mobile ground army and a mobile air army to manage all of it. So really good technique. Flash is incredibly good at doing this, where um, he sends a huge attack forward and then just backs up um, right at the last second with um, everything but like a few vultures and a few tanks. So uh-oh, and unfortunately gets killed. Normally, if you're in an expansion, you can do that thing where you leave two tanks, two vultures, two goliaths to deal with it. But the fact is, all the gateways and the carriers are right there. Not nearly going to be as effective. I think that maybe either pulling all the way back or um, moving directly forward. Um, let me say it one more time. Either pulling everything back or just gunning it for the, the Protoss' main. Either of those, I think, would have been acceptable decisions. And now right here, this is just cleanup for Stork. Stork got the timing window he wanted. These carriers are out. See, he's continuing to delay this push more and more and more and more. As his carrier armies increase, he wants to get in situations like this where it's the Goliaths against Dragoons. And the instant these tanks appear, he's just going to run off. Because right now, what's Terran spending his money on? Well, only Goliaths, right? He can't possibly afford to get anything else because there's four Stargates worth of carriers coming out. By the way, we have 622 viewers. Woo! That's two days in a row with over 600 viewers. You guys are awesome. So yeah, incredible, incredible play by Stork. The fact that he clearly saw that timing window. I would not have been surprised if he had planned to go Arbiters initially. Um, he may have initially planned Carriers, but that I would be interested to see if he did this entire switch to Carriers just because he held off that middle push. And I think that's definitely a switch that all of you should consider in your own play. Um, because it's just so effective. And at this point, you don't need to keep flooding 
with carriers, a lot of times it's equally effective to start going back. Um, it's equally effective to... Ah, um, uh, sorry, I lost my train of thought. It's equally effective to start adding on Templar and Dragoon. Dragoon, Templar, Carrier are an incredibly, incredibly good combination to go for. Um, something that you just may have heard was Skype message. Dr. Helvetica says that he upgraded the plus one air weapons before the push happened. Um... Um, I'm curious if he means before this push right here, because I did see the plus one upgrade when the carriers come out. He was planning on getting carriers from a very, very early stage. And I'm curious um, if there's something that he saw, because again, I do want to re-emphasize the point that carriers are incredibly, incredibly good at um, exploiting a, a Terran player after he's messed up a mid-game attack. Now, you do have to be a little bit careful with that, because let's say you hold off a mid-game attack, but your Terran opponent has seven factories and armory and still has not expanded, and he's just in the mood to try to run you over. He can do that fairly fairly easily. Um, um, yeah, yeah, so just something to be careful of, but almost exactly what Flash did, where Flash did this push, and while he was pushing, he expanded. Perfect situation to go carriers. And I'm really glad that this game actually happened, because in one of my earlier casts, someone asked, um, when are good situations to go carriers? And I struggle to think of a really nice concrete example, and finally I have a really nice one. Another good technique when you have carriers, just throw a Dark Templar in the mix, because the carriers are so loud, with all the interceptors constantly changing directions and the Goliaths firing, that the Dark Templar noise is actually quite hard to hear, and quite hard to even see that something's going on. So DTs can get quite a great many kills. So here's Flash. They were smiling before the game and after the game because they're super good sports. But um, I'm going to rewind just a little bit. I'm going to unmute so that way we have time to take a few questions and we have this ultra early sort of push action coming in here. Yeah, he still hasn't started upgrading these um, this plus one attack yet. I really want to see when he started upgrading it. Hoping I can scan forward to see something like that happen. Because, yeah, there it is. Um, now we have the plus one attack upgrade upgrading. So apparently, it, I think it's pretty clear that Stork, um, that Stork was planning this from the get-go because the Observer's only halfway across the map. Um, but even if it were not, I think it would be a good response to see this sort of thing and then immediately upgrade the plus one attack. So I think that's fantastic. So yeah, let's go ahead and, and take a few questions, because at 7.52, I will just take um, a few questions. Um, so yeah, um, let's just go ahead and do that. So Caleb says, you said that the best way to stay alive with the mid-game push from Terran is to only have Dragoon, but is it still a good idea to get four Zelts plus Shuttle to deal with this push? Yes, yes, 100%, absolutely correctly. Sorry if I didn't emphasize that enough. Um, you get a lot of Dragoons early on, um, and then... Um, if you if you see a push start coming, or if it hasn't you know come yet, and you're worried that it will, you just you have four gateways. That should be the amount that you have. You just get one zealot from each one, pop a shuttle out, and then you go back to making dragoons for a little bit, and then you get the citadel and get a whole bunch of zealots with leg speed. Very very normal sort of thing to do. Um, so yeah, so we have oh man, there was an absolutely great 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 question here that I want to make absolutely certain I get. Um, yeah. Traveler80 says, how does gas stealing allow Stork to control Flash's game plan? This is what I think happens. So, um, let us pretend for a moment we're Flash. Flash says, oh, you stole my gas? Well, that's great. I know your Dragoon's going to be delayed. I know your Dragoon range is going to be delayed. So I'm going to just expand now. And even though my tank is late, my expansion is super early. It's going to be safe because your Dragoons are so late. Um, and I'll still get the tank out just in time to hold off this attack. So, haha, -ha, I have thwarted your um, attempt at screwing me up with a gas steal by taking this expansion really early. Completely reasonable um, thought process from, from Flash. But from Stork's point of view, Stork says, well, um, if my opponent expands like this, or really no matter what my opponent does, he's going to have late factories and hence late pushes. So that allows Stork to very comfortably take a third base really, really early. He actually went um, Dragoon with range, then Nexus at expansion, then Nexus in the bottom right. And I think that is is the key exploit that Stork was able to use from that gas deal. I think that was, that was really, really awesome. So, um, oh man, that's hard. Crankle... 
Crankleberifinifinap. I'm just gonna call him Crankle because that that name has like fifteen thousand letters. So um, why is Flash consistently losing against top Protoss players? Mm, excuse me. His record is four and twelve in two thousand nines. Um, for that matter, uh, why is No Terran currently doing that well against Protosses? So um, I I'm I'm I don't want to speak for all the Terran players. Um. I think I just want to examine Flash, because it's real easy to be like, why is everybody losing? And then if you look at it, you know, like, this Terran player tried Medic Marine and it failed, and this Terran player was winning and screwed up and then lost, you know, and that doesn't really have anything to do with balance, it's just what happened. But I think um, Flash, um, I, I, I know, is trying to develop a new style of Terran vs. Protoss, but he's not really comfortable um, playing it yet. He's claimed that it's like, it's like 80% done, or some arbitrary percent done. Because he does, Flash does have excellent Terran vs. Terran, and really has a new, incredibly powerful Terran vs. Zerg style that he's using to a great effect. But I think that if you're practicing a different style of play, and then before the TV match you go, well that style's not ready, let me just try to go back to my old style. Your old style's not going to be as good as it you know, would usually be. So I think what, what's happening is it's just a little dip. It's an acceptable dip in order to, to change styles, in order, in order to become, like, an overall better player. I mean, you can almost think of it like, um... Here's an example. Uh, there's a lot of really low-level players who get used to hitting control with the thumb and then one with the index finger. So they go control one like this. And this, of course, uh, stems from the very first time you ever use hotkeys, you hit control one. But they do this all the way up until they're, you know, a decent player. Really, you need to stop, go back, and start doing control with your pinky and one with your middle finger or ring finger or index finger because then you can hotkey much faster. There's going to be a period where you get worse in there, but... In the end, you'll be much better. So I think Flash is just doing that. I'm not concerned. Flash is really a... a he, he's a genius. So i um, happy to just, you know... Happy to let him give Stork some losses, because I really, really do like Stork. So that way he can become a, a better player. So, are carriers particularly strong on Heartbreak Ridge? Uh, does the new version have an effect on the efficiency of carriers? What other maps... Um, are carriers valid? I don't like the use of the word valid there. I think everything about the question is fine. I would just maybe reword that that end because um, just because it's hard to be like valid, invalid, good, bad. You know, we don't like to be so black and white. A lot of times it just you know stems from whatever strategy you're doing. So what I would say that on Heartbreak Ridge, let's actually take a look over here at the little uh, my little thingy here. Um, imagine that these are rubble that you cannot pass through. Carriers immediately have a lot more advantage in terms of maneuverability because, you know, you can move between these lanes pretty easily. And the Terran player has to funnel through these incredibly narrow passages. And we've actually seen some pretty nice games where um, a Protoss went carriers on Heartbreak Ridge and the Terran had some difficulty dealing with it. With these new entrances here, Glyphs are going to have a much freer time moving up and down. So I think the carriers will get slightly less effective. Um, so... Um, since I do want to take other questions, uh, an example of a great carrier map is Katrina. <laughs> an example of a really, really bad carrier map, um, something that's really wide open. Like I'd probably say Luna is not the best map for carriers. Maybe even Python would be pretty bad for carriers because it's just so open. You kind of have to move around the corners of the map to have any effective mobility with the carriers, which of course results in um, your expansions being very vulnerable. So, um, oh, I have to take this question from Day Nine Loves Avatar. Um, how can you recover from a failed push? How can Terran prevent themselves from getting run over after defeat? I I would say that the way you um, set yourself up properly is by um, uh, using your push for an advantage instead of for the win. In this game, we saw Flash take an expansion and get another armory up in the course of doing this push. Perfect, beautiful, wonderful thing to do. Because you you want to say to yourself, my push is eventually going to fail. You you literally do go into your first push thinking that. You think, I might win, but it, it's pretty much most of the time going to eventually fail. But when that push fails, I will be in a much better position than my Protoss opponent. So um, Stork had those three bases, but had only just barely stabilized on three bases. Flash had three bases and the armory and six factories. 
situation's looking good for Flash. And, of course, the immediate question I think that Day 9 Loves Avatar could ask is, well, why did Flash end up getting crushed so badly later on? I think it's because Flash just didn't scout that bottom right. I think that if Flash had done that, he would have been in a much, 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 much better situation. and would have been able to exploit that a little bit more. I don't want to say I'm positive of that because maybe um, Stork has a way to defend that bottom expansion with something incredibly clever that I have not thought of, so... I definitely want to give him the benefit of the doubt. So I'm going to go ahead and mute the chat just to sort of cut down on this question amount. Um, so Pretty Little Pony says, How do you deal with a Carrier Dragoon Templar mix? Is there any time to kill a Protoss ground arm before it gets too many carriers? Really, Carrier Dragoon Templar is just death. It is so, so hard to deal with. Um, and the answer to dealing with it is just, you know, prevent your parent opponent from really getting in that situation. Um... So, yeah, I mean, th those are the sorts of things that you want to make sure that, um, sorry, I got a little bit distracted there. Um, you really want to batter down the Protoss opponent to a situation where, even if he does get the Dragoon Templar Carrier combo, you have so much stuff that it's okay. The counter, I hate to use the word counter, but the way to defeat Carrier Dragoon Templar is just to have so much stuff that you effectively are fine. Even if you lose masses in this incredibly inefficient manner, you still have more stuff in the end. So I'm just going to take two more questions because it's currently 8 p.m. Um, Hyuk says, should you always double expand as Protoss when a Terran fast expands? Um, not necessarily. It depends on what style of play you're trying to do. Um, what I would say is that if you decide to two base, make sure you have a, either a very nice timing attack to really crush Terran, or you do a lot of harassment to the Terran to keep his economy down. If you double expand, you're basically saying, yeah, 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 you get that expansion, but I am going to um, pick two and I'm going to play a little bit more defensively so that way I can hold off your timing push. I like to think of them as alternatives. Um, but no, you don't really always have to double expand by, by any means. So let's just take one more super incredibly, wonderfully brilliant question. And it looks like... Um, um, actually, I'll take this question one more. S'more says, how do you know when to kill interceptors versus going for the carriers themselves? Generally, you kill the interceptors when you're approaching the carriers, and then um, you shoot the carriers when they're in range, but then as you're backing off, you shoot the interceptors. So, in essence, kill the carriers if you can, and all the rest of the time, just kill off the interceptors. Or, if you have tanks sieged, um, and you can't really push forward and there's a big ground army, you're pretty much only going to be going for the interceptors because you can inch a little bit forward with the Goliaths, but then you have to pull them right back because of this ground army. But killing interceptors, th actually the most important thing to do is just get really good upgrades from your Goliaths. That's what kills the interceptors very, 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 very effectively. Um, so, yes. Do, 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 do. Um... You know what, I'm, I'm going to take this and one more thing. So F-Zero says, Is this game another example of the overpowered Double Nexus strategy? Idris says Double Nexus is 70% win in Protoss vs. Terran. Um, there's no such thing as overpowered or underpowered, really. I mean, um, that's kind of like saying, well, 12 hatch early expand for Zerg is overpowered, because 90% of Zerg games, you know, you win that way. But, you know, that's just, like, it's, it's so standard that that's why that ends up being that way. Um... Oh, here's a great last question from Ninja. I'm going to go ahead and unmute chat and uh, we'll no longer be taking any questions. Ninja says, do you think if Flash had better spread out with his tank placement and better mind placement, do you think that his timing push would have been more successful? I think it's actually critical when you're doing an early push to cluster those tanks together very, very tightly. Um, when you cluster tanks together that tightly it becomes increasingly difficult for that shuttle with speed zealots to do any damage. I think he maybe could have had a little bit better placement with his mines, but I think that if he spread his tanks out and Stork did end up getting a shuttle with zealots, which is entirely reasonable, that the push would have died really, really quickly. So if you're doing these early sorts of pushes, cluster those tanks incredibly tightly around a, um, around a turret, and then um, inch forward and take key positions. I don't really want to say inch forward, but just take key positions one at a time. That might be with a really big, rapid forward movement, or, you know, might be just a quick little ninja whoop, going up. So, um, yeah. So right now we have uh, currently finished Day 9 Daily, number 32. I'll be doing the OSL casts in 
Five and a half hours. Um, going to go watch the matches right now. All of you should as well. Apparently the first game has already started, so everyone should ch -ch -ch check that one out. And thanks so much for tuning in. The matches are on tonight at 1.30 a.m. Pacific, or exactly five and a half hours from now. So thanks so much for tuning in, everybody. Tomorrow, tomorrow we're watching me against Zelos. Um, so yeah, we'll be watching a game of me um, lose, and I think it will be a very, very constructive example. Um, especially, it was in 2004 I played that game against Zelos, when Zelos was actually like super, he was really on top of his game. I th still think I gave him a good fight, but um, I actually had a dream about it like two weeks ago, um, that I actually didn't make the mistake in that second game to lose. And then I lost in game three, so it's not a big deal. Um, but yeah, so thanks so much for tuning in everybody. Waha! Big hearts, and uh, peace out!